Michelle, or do we? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let's have Kay Soul kick us off here. Thank okay. You. Well, thank you all. And I, I just always enjoy being with both co coalitions, uh, which I've been doing for many years. And I really appreciate people who have typed in where they're from. And it's pretty interesting if you've been watching it go through the chat, because we have people not only from all over Washington, but we also have some Oregonians and some from, some from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we also have some representatives the funder side of this story, which I'm very happy to have. And we have Judy with us, which I'm very happy to have, uh, because we have a lot to talk about today. And as you heard us mentioning while we were just getting ready to start, um, this is a long webinar. It goes till noon. And so I am planning to take a break about 1030 so everybody can move a little bit. And I, I've been thinking about that as about a 10 minute break. Um, I, the danger is always that people pick up their phone or open up their email and they're just lost to us. So um, please don't do that, uh, but do move around because otherwise this is uh, this is kind of beyond the power of the human back to sit still for. And I have some real thank yous to offer to all of you who responded to the survey. I just got another one this morning, so I appreciate that. And especially to Donna and Misty, who took time to talk to me, to just bring me up to date about what's going on in their organizations and what they're hoping for from this webinar. So the combination of those of you who responded to the survey and Donna and Misty's comments kind of guided how I organized the topic. Um, and of course, Michelle and Dee have been incredibly helpful as we get ready for this. And I'm counting on them to still be helpful uh, if we run into any technical difficulties while we're doing this. Um, so what I told them, and I'll tell all of you, is this topic is going to be so much more interesting if you will chat in questions and comments, and you could actually speak them in too. So I've got Michelle watching for any raised hands. And questions are great. They help clarify topics. But comments where you might say, no, I really disagree with you, those are really helpful too, because so much of what we're going to be talking about today involves strategy. And of course, anytime you have strategy, there's many ways to do something. And so I'm always interested in how other people are looking at this. And the only way to find that out is if you will say something. Um, so that's my big request for you. And definitely questions. Um, I don't think we're pushed for time today. So don't feel like, well, I'm going to interrupt things and we won't get through. We will get through and your question will help. So I wanted to start just to get a quick picture of who's actually with us. Um, so I think Michelle's going to put a poll up to ask you what's your role in domestic violence or sexual assault. And um, did the poll go up? Okay, because I can't see it for some it's reason. Up, oh, yeah. now I can see it. Now it's on. I, I have to tell you, I'm watching multiple screens. I don't do too well with them, but I did find it. And so you are all answering. And um, this is kind of what I was hoping for. I do want to be sure you, and, and can they all see it, Michelle, or do you need to publish the results? Yes, I'll, I'll publish it. Just give okay. a minute here, make sure everybody is. Yeah. Mostly done. There okay. we go. Great. So what I can see is that we do have the majority fiscal people, which is who we were originally appealing to. But it's going to be very helpful to have some executive directors with us because this issue of strategy around these financial challenges, it really is not something that one person alone can handle. So the executive directors are going to be very helpful. And I'm also really glad to have some funders here because there are always questions and always sort of, well, did you really say that? Um, so I'm glad to have that. I do want everybody to know they're here. Um, and then we have some other, and um, those of you who clicked others, maybe you could just chat in uh, what your role is so I have 
have some idea of um, who else is here and I'll try to target it. I don't think we're going to be buried in technical accountant talk too badly. Um, I think this is going to be in common speech, but I do. Um, oh, great. Fiscal compliance manager for a national nonprofit. That's very helpful. You will have some tips for us. Um, but I do want to invite anyone who starts feeling like I'm using acronyms or I'm using terms that are confusing to you. Um, if it's confusing to you, it's confusing to somebody else. So please say something and we can talk about it in a, a more understandable way. And there they come. Boy, we've got a lot of different others. So thank you for sharing that. Now, how did I organize our topics? Well, um, it seemed to me that it would help to start by talking about the COVID era strategic challenges. And actually, as we were getting ready, Michelle <laughs> mentioned the biggest challenge of all in the COVID era, which is complete unpredictability. There's just constant change. And we, we sometimes feel like we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow or in the next hour. Uh, but I do think in domestic violence and sexual assault, we can hone in on some major strategic challenges that have arisen during the COVID period and are going to carry us forward um, even if we eventually see the end to this period. Because all of us are involved in funding that comes with restrictions, particularly federal funds, even though they come through the states, um, part of the framing of our response to these challenges has to deal with compliance and what those requirements put on us. And increasingly, as I looked at the information in the surveys, domestic violence and sexual assault programs have succeeded in diversifying their funding streams. So they are not entirely de dependent on government funding, but actually complying becomes more complicated when you have more different funding streams that are not governmental. So we're going to we're going to talk about both the compliance requirements we have to keep going with and then the ways that they pose challenges when we've gotten individual donation funding, foundation funding, fee for service funding. A lot of what I'm interested in is how we can identify some options to address the challenges and how we can actually test those options out as much as possible in an unpredictable world. And I'm especially interested in once we do that, once we come up with some options to address the challenges and we really build a model so we can see what we're talking about, how do we engage the board and the staff in the meaningful choices? Not in a lot of detail, because if you're a fiscal person, they're counting on us to take care of the details. But sometimes I think we get so absorbed in the detail that we forget that we have to really consult others and we have to consult them in a way that they can understand and participate in the choices. And because some of what we do in terms of our financial plan um, and in terms of communicating the financial plan and the financial options, because some of it is complex, it's actually hard to communicate it to people who are not thinking about the financial side all the time. And so we're going to spend some time talking about some techniques that might help with that communication. And that's another place where I'm really hoping I can hear from people in terms of what's working for you. So that's the plan for today. And um, here's my list of strategic challenges. And this is where um, we really could use some help and some uh, some participation if you have other major challenges that you are dealing with. Now, uh, some of you know I've been involved in domestic violence and sexual assault work for years. And I know that over those years, we have improved the way we work with survivors dramatically. And we have really um, come to understand what it takes to provide our core services in a way that works for all victims and survivors and respects the differences among them. 
But I still believe that in each organization, it is possible to go back and look at all the different things that we are doing and identify those that are absolutely core to our existence and to our community. And that's where it really makes a difference, whether you are in a larger community with multiple programs and multiple other resources, or you are in a rural area where you may be the total resource available for victims and survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. So I, I suspect that your description of what is absolutely core, what do we absolutely have to be able to deliver no matter how bad a funding cut gets, no matter how serious a challenge is, we've got to keep this available. And I work from the perspective that that's the most important thing as we do financial strategy is to ensure that we can keep that core available. Now, I know you've had endless conversations about the challenges that we have right now in hiring and retaining great staff. And, you know, I think for most of us, this is like a mixed blessing challenge because most of us have been working for a time when workers who do direct services could get a decent wage and have a decent job. We've been working for that all our lives. And now the pressure on wages and overall compensation actually is making that true. Um, it, more than it was before, it's not perfect, but uh, for many of us, we're competing with McDonald's now. Um, and that is a sad day, although it's a good day if McDonald's has come up. So it's this mixed blessing of, um, makes it harder for us to figure out how are we going to hire and even more importantly retain staff and uh, in this competitive environment uh, and I hope that we can have some good conversation about the financial side of retention. And I know many of you have talked about the need to change your compensation, and I would say change your working conditions, change your support environment to retain people. Uh, because you know that from a financial viewpoint, turnover is incredibly costly. Um, it is costly in terms of service quality. It's costly in terms of exhausting the other staff and leading to their burnout. Uh, it's costly in terms of retraining, constant retraining. So what are we going to do in our financial planning and our financial strategies that puts us in a better position to hire and retain the staff we need, even if some of us are facing some cutbacks? How are we going to do that. Now, we are not going to talk about how to solve the housing affordability crisis today. I mean, I, I wish I had the magic wand, but I just want to acknowledge it as a challenge that I think is really impacting all of our work because in almost all domestic violence and sexual assault programs, we are working with survivors who are going to need to establish housing that they can afford and that is safe for them. And as even in the most rural communities, the housing crisis escalates, we're going to see that that changes some of the dynamics of how we can help people because we have sort of a big plug at the end of our process that in the past would have ended with people moving into a safe place on their own and us finding ways to support them there. And now suddenly for many of us that moving into a safe place is an incredibly difficult challenge. As I mentioned before, I am aware and the survey just really brought it home that more domestic violence and sexual assault programs have succeeded in reducing their dependence on governmental funding. And that is very good news, but it is also very challenging from the standpoint of management and investment of resources and maintaining compliance with the government funding. And so we're going to talk specifically about uh, the impact of having diversified and for some of us still wanting to do more diversification of our funding streams. We are going to talk about compliance because that's part of what we advertised and because some really strange things have happened during the COVID era in terms of how we are having to deal not only with the basic uniform grants guidance, the basic federal requirements, but with some new twists on those requirements. So we're going to talk about that. And my goal there is 
really context for when we move into talking about, well, what are some strategies we should test out? And I was really glad when Judy Chen signed on because I heard from everybody the single topic that had the greatest number of, we got to talk about that, was VOCA cutbacks. And um, I think, and, and I asked Judy before we started, well, Judy, can you explain it all in just a couple of minutes? Um, and could you tell us, you know, well, how bad is it going to be? And when's it going to happen? And what's it going to most impact? And uh, Judy <laughs> said, well, that would be nice. But I do want her to say just a little bit to set the context to make sure we're all dealing from a common base of understanding when we toss out, oh, VOCA cutbacks, what, what are we really talking about? So Judy? And I think you're muted. There we okay. Go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, here is what's happening. Let me pull up my email. Um, Washington state and across the board, US states and territories are experiencing a major reduction in one of the funding streams. Um, it's a federal funding stream called VOCA or Victims of Crime Act. This is not the only funding stream for survivor services, but it's an important one. And it's become um, the single largest source of funding for crime victim services in at least in our state. Um, VOCA is not funded by taxpayer dollars unlike every other funding, almost every other funding source um, that we have. It's funded by um, uh, settlement fees um, with, uh, for um, federal, um, federal prosecution of uh, white collar crime mainly. And so by its very nature, it fluctuates. Um, however, for a lot of uh, unrelated complex reasons, we had a huge rise to, um, and with a peak or a bubble, in federal fiscal year 2018 and reached a peak of $74 million. And then that has been declining rapidly. And now we're at, oh, I think Michelle helped me out. Um, at, I think 25 million. And so it's a drop of about $50 million. Earlier this year, WISCADIV, um, WICSAP and uh, the Child Advocacy Center Coalition, some other groups came together and we were able to secure um, some funding from the legislature, uh, $15 million in supplemental funding for, um, to address the known shortfall at the time. However, um, as of this fall, we have an updated projection of the shortfall and it's going to be even more than we had understood before or that we knew before. So now, um, the state funder that administers these federal funds, OCVA or Office of Crime Victims Advocacy, um, has now um, issued notice to the field saying here are going to be some reductions. Um, what's changing and um, you know, has put Wiscative on, I would say orange level alert, um, is that it's not just cutbacks of uh, reductions in um, competitive grant funding, but what we think of as the, um, is the on, what, what is the formula or ongoing funding um, could be called core funding, but I want to stay away from the word core because that implies a lot of different things, mainly in the sexual assault world. So um, what we think of as our ongoing non-competitive funding for domestic violence services, sexual assault services, crime victims, advocacy, child advocacy centers and civil legal services. So what's happening now? Kay, can I keep going? Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> just, you're doing great. And I think this is gonna help us as we go through the rest of the topics, go for it. So I'm gonna give some specifics and then I'm gonna paint like, the, like step back and, and look with you at the bigger picture. Cause I know that you're feeling like this is just a roller coaster ride, right? especially for those of you who are executive directors, program directors, or you're in the, you're, you're the fiscal um, leadership for the organization. So um, shorter term, WISCADIV, along with our colleagues at WICSAP and, and others, we're going back to the legislature. And right now we, are, we have an ask in for the governor's budget for um, another somewhere between seven and $8 million for this, you know, Washington state budget goes on a two year cycle, so we can ask for the second year um, to address that um, newest shortfall. Um, and, um, 
and we're in conversation, uh, the, the complexities of how to administer these funds and the rules and all that stuff with the state agency, it's, you know, we're working with them on that. And we've really heard loud and clear from all of you that um, this is just so stressful and how can we make it simpler? Bigger picture. I think that we have, you know, what Kay had said, we have this, um, a consequence of all the great advocacy and success we've had in Washington state around diversifying funding. Is in many states, there's um, only FIPSA funds or um, Family Violence Prevention Services Act funds. There's very little other, and VOCA funds. There's very other little funding, no funding from the state, you know, all that. And so um, they're really in trouble, but it's also a lot simpler. In this state, we have a, a relatively rich, I know it might not feel that way, but a relatively rich assortment of funding streams. And it's a real problem that one of them instead, because all the other ones kind of march along like this, you can predict, right? With VOCA, there's, it's almost impossible to predict it. And we have been riding this roller coaster of highs and lows. Right now we're in, in the low. Um, we have hope. Um, we were finally able to, you know, um, get Congress to pass the VOCA fix. It's unlikely we'll ever go back to that bubble of $74 million, but, you know, I am hoping that it will even out. We don't know where. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But, you know, longer term, we need to have more predictability. You deserve to have more predictability around these funds. And what that might mean is having a conversation over the next, not this year, but into next year around what, what do we need to go back to policymakers and the public to say, you all think that there is this steady funding for domestic violence and sexual assault services, but actually it's not very steady. So um, that is a really big conversation, um, but it's a conversation we need to have. So um, I wish that I could tell you what, where we will level off, what I'm hoping that we'll be able to do, and, and Michelle, you know, um, correct me where I'm wrong here. What, I, what we're hoping for is if we can get that one-year supplemental funding from um, the governor's budget from the state legislature, that we'll at least be able to pull back from having these um, cuts, these 15% cuts that many of you have been informed about. I wanna emphasize that it's not a cut to your whole entire funding. It's a cut to the, this one slice of funding. Okay, the okay end. That, Judy, that is exactly what I was hoping you would do. <laughs> Thank you so much. And it actually leads us to the final bullet point on this slide, which is one of the real challenges when you're on that roller coaster that Judy just described is you know, yes, you've been there before. You know how to think about specific direct service cuts, specific personnel cuts that you might need to make or specific um, victim assistance cuts you might need to make. But you have an additional problem if, these, if the funding source being cut is one that has been absorbing a portion of your administrative costs and your other shared costs in your organization, which it will have. That's how these grants work. And one of the things that we've learned over time when we face funding reductions on a, a significant source is it's much easier to reduce the cost of the service dollars that we've been spending than it is to reduce the cost of our overall management function. It's not because we're extravagant and we just want to waste money on management. And it's not that. It's that particularly if you are an agency with a budget under $5 million, which I think most of the people on the call are, there's a minimum level of management that you have to provide. And it's expensive. 
and it's not going to diminish or be able to be cut back as quickly as saying, okay, we can't have that position or we can only have three-fourths of that position for someone who's been providing direct services. So we're going to talk about some tools to use to test out what to do about that, but I just want to raise that as one of the challenges. And, and I also put this on here because, you know, great news, we've diversified funding frustrating news, it may make it even more difficult for us to fully recover our administrative and our other shared or indirect costs. So that's the context for what we're going to do today. And uh, yeah, I see, I see Judy typed in questions. I think people probably have a million questions about VOCA, but if there's some that really we should hear now, we'll keep watching and see what people type in. Well, I think we should just say a little bit more about what is this diversification of funding that we've been talking about and um, the one where I think there's still the greatest variation in responses that I've seen is the fees for service. This is problematic in domestic violence and sexual assault because uh, the whole premise of our core services is that they are free to anyone. But I do know that in sexual assault and in some other programs, uh, the program has figured out a way to um, participate uh, in billing for some services that is permissible. If you're doing that, that's interesting. I do see some domestic violence programs that have contracts to provide community education and prevention services with school districts and others. So there are some fees for services coming into our programs and they become part of this mix. Um, and you know, the whole discussion of is that a good thing or should you try to do more of it with those fees, that's a little beyond what we're going to do today, but how do you manage them is very much what we're going to be doing today. So, you know, when we talk about the challenges of having built this diversified mixed funding model, um, well, the first challenge that we've had all along is how do we make sure that the grant funding and gift funding, particularly the foundation grant funding and the donor gift funding, doesn't end up getting targeted to very specialized projects, you know, the so-called innovation uh, bias that many foundations, and if we're not careful, some donors can have, rather than simply asking people to help us do our core work, we get trapped into asking for special projects, which are generally they're good things that do need to be done but if we're in a situation we're not where we're threatened in our ability to continue delivering the core we are going to have to figure out a way to be sure that we whenever possible are getting funding that is given to us on an unrestricted basis with the donor foundation being confident that we will make the best decision on how to spend those dollars and I, I know you've all been following Mackenzie Bezos and her, uh, her approach to philanthropy, which is a leading approach now, and it's very popular with major foundations to say, look, if you're a funder, the things you should be concerned about are, is this an important issue in our community, one, Two, do we believe this organization is capable of doing a great job on this issue? Two, and from there, just give them the money. Now, we're seeing the larger foundations move that way and some large philanthropists, but unfortunately, some of us still are doing grant writing and are kind of haven't shifted our mind to realize that the old way of looking at this, where we thought we had to cook up some special new project to ask for foundation money or to interest a donor, we're, we're restricting our own money by how we're asking. So that's one of the challenges and kind of one of the solutions I hope we're going to move towards. I think a tough question right now is that, you know, a lot of you have had success in increasing individual giving and what you, I think, have learned is it takes money to raise money. And so if you are going to go through a period where you have a cutback in a major grant source that has been funding important services, what's the impact of that on your decision about further investment in individual giving? So we're, we're going to talk about that. Um, 
uncertainty is kind of our life here. Um, that's probably one of the reasons we can really communicate with victims and survivors. We, we understand what it means to not know what's going to happen. Um, and I think most of us have found ways to deal with it, but I think that sometimes that is an issue that is hard to communicate with our boards and with our staff. I mean, they know in general, yes, there's a lot of uncertainty, but they don't see, well, what is the implication of that for the decisions we're going to make? So we're going to talk about that. And finally, uh, you know, a challenge of having a mixed funding model is that federal funding management requirements require you to use your cost allocation plan or your indirect cost rate as the context for how you charge certain shared costs and management costs to all of your sources of funding. And that does not agree with the way that many donors think, with the way that many foundations think. And so we have a problem of needing to apply a system, our cost allocation system, across funding sources that are not very open to it. And so how are we going to address that challenge? I, I believe it, it's a problem that can be solved, but it is a problem. So I thought, yeah, Judy. Um. I, I want to touch on something that you said, given that we're talking about in the COVID area or COVID era, yeah. which is that, you know, all of you, all of us, we are managing funds um, and people have a lot of trauma triggers about when there's money that's going down. And for, you know, for the, those of us who are, you know, survivors or who have come from, um, if you come from a, a, you know, economic hardship, um, background, or, you know, you're working with people who, I think all of us are working with people who have those life experiences. Um, you know, talking about uh, reductions can be very triggering for people, especially now that um, so many people in the general public all of a sudden get what we've been saying all along, which is that, you know, money matters, right? Money matters for surviving. It's not just like your personal willpower. So, um, you know, we have a role to play and sometimes there can be, you know, Kay, you've spoken quite eloquently over the years about how there can be this, you know, um, fiscal managers are from Mars and advocates are from Venus kind of, you know, communication gap. Um, and it can lead to a lot of organizational turmoil. So, you know, I'm hoping that if, if that resonates for you, you know, let's, um, you know, sometime between now and 12, like, like, you know, be thinking about that, share your, share how you're handling that, um, because it's something that, you know, we, like, we are holding some of that stress, you know, and we need to decide, like, how much do I share to be transparent, and how much do I, you know, manage, like, how do I manage the communication so people aren't just freaking out? Yeah, I think that's so important and, and actually it, it brings to my mind an experience I've just had with my own sister that I think illustrates what you're talking about. My sister is trying to complete one of those advanced medical directives and she's gone to several seminars that are to help you understand the questions and she's told me that she's had to just sign out of the Zoom meetings halfway through because she's so overwhelmed by anxiety and fear at what they're talking about that she's realized she's not listening, she can't understand what they're saying. And I think that that is what has often happened when people try to explain complicated budget choices when what the listener is hearing is my job is at risk um, and what am I going to do if I don't have this job um, or our benefits are at risk. And what am I going to do? And I think, like my sister, the anxiety is so overwhelming that nothing else gets through. So I think that is one of our biggest challenges in, is to communicate with others about what the choices are. And at least for me, um, I, always, I always feel better when someone can tell me that there are choices um, and that it is not just be a victim and let somebody destroy you. Um, so, uh, but that I'm, that's easier said than done. So thank you for kind of pulling that in. Um, 
Okay, well, this is just, uh, now I'm about to launch into a little bit about the compliance framework, and this is where the uh might happen, <laughs> particularly for the non-fiscal people. It might be like, oh, that's why I hired somebody to do this. I don't want to think about it. It's not that hard, and it is important to understand how it works. And I've put quite a few slides in that are more for reference, so don't get overwhelmed by, oh, it's going to go on forever. It isn't. We're going to take a break at 1030, and hopefully we're going to get to some of the core issues. Um, and since I know in Washington, most of the federal money comes into domestic violence and sexual assault by way of contracts with the state or counties or other local jurisdictions. Occasionally it comes through an agreement with another nonprofit. Um, so that situation where you don't get the money directly from the federal government, but the funder that you do get it from is getting it from the federal government, that evokes all of these federal requirements and the state or any other, we call those entities pass-through entities, and the state or any other pass-through entity can add requirements to an agreement where they're handing you federal funds, but they can't subtract the federal requirements. So, um, you know, those of us who work in this field know a whole lot about the Uniform Grants Guidance to CFR 200, and you're going to see that acronym dance through these slides. Slides, and it, it stands for the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, truly, I mean, no one would ever need to take a sleeping pill if they could locate the Code of Federal Regulations on their computer and just browse through it at nighttime because it, it is uh, sleep-inducing. Um, unless you're worried about one of the provisions, then it's like sleep-preventing. But not all federal sources require compliance with the uniform guidance, and we've just been through that with some of the COVID money, so we are going to talk about that. And here's just all the links, and you know, we said in the promo for this, uh, a big deal for the feds was that they did finally complete revisions to the uniform grants guidance in 2020. And all of those revisions are in effect now. And so if you want to read all about it, here are the links and to the ones that I think are kind of the most relevant to what we're doing. So really when you are the person charged with maintaining compliance, your first step is to look at each one of the funding agreements that your organization has signed and figure out for sure whether you are being described as a federal recipient or sub-recipient. Now, if we're talking about a, a grant agreement that you have with the state of Washington, you are probably going to be described as a sub-recipient, meaning the state got federal money and they passed it through to you they're required to reference this 2 CFR 200, so that's another way you'll know that it applies. Um, we used to say, look for the CFDA number, that stands for Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance. It tells you which specific federal program this money came from, and that's important for you to know because you'll be able to look up the specific regulations for that program. Um, but now they call that the assistance listing number, but it's the same system. And the whole reason I'm talking about this piece of it is that occasionally I find domestic violence and sexual assault programs that have some federal money coming to them, but it is not subject to the Uniform Grants Guidance, not because it's a specific program that doesn't require that in a subrecipient agreement, but because it's actually considered a true contract. Now, we'll say more about that later, but, you know, we have a lot of terminology that people use rather loosely. And I have seen people refer to agreements that are like VOCA fund agreements as a contract. Well, that's not the meaning within the federal system. There's a very specific meaning to subrecipient and contractor. And so the words you're looking for to understand whether you're subject to the Code of Federal Regulations um, Uniform Grants Guidance is you're looking for a subrecipient in there. Now, one of the weird things that happened is when the 
Coronavirus Relief Fund was passed, um, and its program number was 21.019, they didn't make it subject to the Uniform Grants Guidance. Now, the whole point of the Uniform Grants Guidance, when it was first adopted back in 2014-15, the whole point was to bring uniformity to the system of federal funds management, to stop having so many different rules. And, uh, and they did pretty well at the beginning. And then suddenly we had this COVID money come in and the Congress decided that Treasury, the U.S. Treasury, should administer this money. And they decided not to have it subject to the entire Uniform Grants Guidance. And so they called out these specific sections of the Uniform Grants Guidance and said, um, okay, you got to follow these rules. It created no end of confusion for organizations that are following the Uniform Grants Guidance. Probably the biggest area of confusing, we'll talk more about it later, was that they said, we, we're not accepting indirect cost rates. So if you've had some of this uh, CARES money, the, the Coronavirus Relief Fund money, you've probably already dealt with that challenge. If you want to read what Treasury did say when they stepped out of the whole system that was supposed to be uniform, you can read these links. And again, good sleep aids. Um, and there's more resources to read. The one that might be new to some people, I just want to call out, is the compliance supplement. Now, that comes out every year, and it comes from the Office of Management and Budget. And it's really important if you're the person who is responsible for the financial management because what that document does is it goes federal program by federal program and it tells auditors what are you supposed to be paying attention to in this kind of funding? What should you be testing? What areas do you need to be sure you are aware of? So when I get a new grant and I'm not familiar with the funding source or even if I have an old grant but I think things might have changed, I look forward to the compliance supplement that's going to come out in that year because it's a preview of what's the auditor going to be hassling me about because that's what they have to do to perform a satisfactory single audit. Now that's what we used to call um, the A133 audit. Um, and I'm going to keep moving on and say that sometimes we forget when we're talking about all these federal rules and the CFRs, we forget that an essential principle in the Uniform Grants Guidance is that each organization has to have all these policies and procedures and that actually the auditor's first job is to test whether you followed your own policies and procedures. And so sometimes, particularly when we get new fiscal people and they're sort of overwhelmed with the Uniform Grants Guidance and all the specific regs, they forget that central to this whole process is that you have all the required policies, which you probably do, particularly if you're sexual assault and you're being being uh, accredited, I mean, they, they test, they know that you've got all these policies, but they forget that they have to follow their own policies and that going to workshops and hearing about the federal rules isn't the answer, that you have to look to your own stuff. So what are we going to do in the next 10 minutes? Well, we're going to talk about uh, the first big change that came in the revisions to the Uniform Grants Guidance, and it's really the one that I uh, poses the most challenges and opens the most opportunities. The rest of them are not that interesting and a lot. I'm just going to say I'll give you more information afterwards if you want them. But these are the ones that I think are going to be relevant to what we're going to be doing when we try to cope with the challenges that we started out with. And the, the blue arrow there, the indirect cost, the treatment of indirect costs, I believe in the revisions to Uniform Grants Guidance, the feds made some real progress in being clearer about what they meant when they adopted the Uniform Grants Guidance. But before you can really understand how much progress they made, we got to define a couple of terms that just are, they are bears, these terms. The first one is indirect costs. And that term is very commonly misunderstood. Um, it really means any cost that you might have that you cannot directly attribute to a specific program or to a specific grant. 
and think about it if you back when you had people all in one place together and you paid rent for that facility you really could not specifically identify the cost of rent for one of your programs or for one of your funding sources you had to allocate it so that's what an indirect cost is people get confused because of another term that is called indirect cost rates we're going to talk about that too but the basic concept of indirect cost is just a cost that cannot be directly attributed now the other bearer of a term is administrative costs because so many funders are obsessed with limiting the uh, amount of their funds that can be spent on so-called administrative costs. And we know that in some statutes uh, authorizing particular funding programs, they even build in limits on administrative cost. Now, one of the common confusions is that that is the same thing as a limit on indirect cost. It isn't. It's a limitation on a specific kind of cost, an administrative cost. And on the slide here, we've got the most common definition of what is an administrative cost. And if you've been around for a while, you know that you don't define what is an administrative cost by looking at the title of a position. You don't say, oh, we have an executive director, that must be an administrative cost. To know what kind of cost the executive director's compensation is, you have to actually know what that executive director does. And they probably do do some board support, and they probably do oversee the financial management, and they probably are involved in strategic planning. But in smaller organizations, that executive director is probably also quite involved in the delivery of services and in doing community education. So we can't assume by a title that some person or the costs associated with them are an administrative cost, but it is central to figuring out our compliance and it's central to thinking about how we ask for money from foundations and others. So, you know, once you figured out somebody's doing administrative work, okay, the, the defined kinds of administrative work, then you have to say, well, the cost of employing them, including their benefits and all that is part of the administrative cost. And if you have some non-personnel costs associated with their work, like you get them some office supplies and you give them a laptop and uh, maybe you give them a space to work in, the, the share of those costs is also an administrative cost. It's the cost to perform the administrative function. And obviously having an independent audit is an administrative cost, a professional service cost. And you bring in a consultant who is gonna help improve your fiscal system, that's an administrative cost. So that's what we're talking about. And just to kind of finally, I hope, nail it, um, the key difference in all of the rest of this conversation that we're going to be making is between costs that are direct and costs that are indirect. Um, that is, direct costs you can associate with a specific function. I hired a domestic violence support group leader, and that's all the person did. That's a direct cost. Indirect cost, it's not associated directly with a specific function. In fact, it benefits more than one function. And um, occupancy in the shared facility that we no longer have in a lot of programs. IT expense, we gotta have an IT system for the whole operation. Um, that's an indirect cost. Now, this confusion between admin and indirect really makes it hard to talk about these costs, but if you hold on to that distinction, it will make it easier. Now, um, this has always been true under the Uniform Grants Guidance, but what happened with the 2020 revisions is they explicitly affirmed that there are four different ways that a subrecipient, like a domestic violence or sexual assault program, can claim administrative and indirect costs. And we use this term recover, meaning can I charge it to an award? And they said there's four different ways that a subrecipient can recover these costs. 
they can direct charge those costs. That is, they can use a cost allocation plan. And most of you, as I looked at the surveys, are using the direct charging method. And we'll look at that in a moment. The other three methods, I put them in gold because they're all related to each other. And that is they're using indirect cost rates. And that is a different methodology than direct charging. Why is it different? Well, because in federal terms, when we have an indirect cost rate, we actually report that information on a line called indirect costs. And when we're using the direct charging method, the green one, we don't put anything on indirect costs line. And the, four, the three yellow columns there are three different ways of getting an indirect cost rate. But the first choice is, do you want one at all or do you want to continue direct charging? Now, what I saw in the survey is that overwhelmingly, more of you were choosing in the yellow category, the 10% de minimis rate, rather than the federal rates that are in the other two yellow boxes. So we had a mixture of people who were doing direct charging through cost allocation and those using the 10% de minimis. It does matter which way you uh, do it, but the most important thing that happened in the revised Uniform Grants Guidance was the Fed said explicitly that it is the subrecipient, it is you that chooses what method to use. Um, so a funder cannot require you to use the de minimis rate. Um, they must permit you to use that green direct charging method. They can't snow, say, no, that's not an indirect cost rate. It isn't an indirect cost rate, but it is a permissible way of recovering administrative and other shared costs. And if you have gone through the process of negotiating with the federal government to get an indirect cost rate, your pass-through entity must accept it and honor it. So they really spelled it out more clearly than in the original guidance. And they clarified that um, they had pass-through entities, that's like the state, have to accept direct charging. Um, they have to, ex if, that is, if the organization used the principles for cost allocation that are provided in that code section. And of course, you got to have a written cost allocation plan and you have to remember that this is not an indirect cost rate and you shouldn't be listing anything on a line that says indirect costs. So before we break, I want to at least look at what an organization doing this direct charging is doing. And the way this document is set up, and let's see if I can get my pointer working. It's set up, whoops, no, I didn't do it, sorry. Okay, there we go. It's set up with the th three programs, you have more than three, I know. And these are all talking about direct costs that are in those programs, those costs that we could directly attribute to a program. And then they have a column called shared cost, which are these common costs that have to be allocated. And what they've done is they've gone through these shared costs and they used an allocation formula to share them out among the programs. And so when they're submitting a billing for program three, they are gonna report on the $2 million in direct cost and then these categories of shared cost as line items and the whole thing is going to be characterized as direct cost nothing is going to be characterized as indirect cost so when we're talking about using direct charging that's what we're talking about and um that that is in contrast to deciding to use the 10 percent de minimis rate and um the thing that happened in the revisions to the Uniform Grants Guidance is that they said that really anyone can use the 10% rate. There had been limitations when the Uniform Grants Guidance came out. Now it doesn't matter if you used to have an indirect cost rate. If you want to use the 10% rate, you can use it. There's no negotiation. You don't have to prove anything. You just declare that you're going to use it. And they, 
it can't be required that you use it and uh, you, you have the other rates as choices. They kept the same method for computing the de minimis rate and I think it's worth mentioning and illustrating that that is not 10% of the total grant. That is not what the de minimis rate is. The way you get to the de minimis rate is you have to be able to understand what your modified total direct costs are. And that is done by laying out the costs of each of your programs, including your programs that don't have federal funds in them, foundation grants, things you support with individual donations, your fee-for-service programs. It's everything. All of your direct costs are laid out by the different program, and they're added up to give a total modified total direct cost number. Now, what's not in that number? Well, let's start with there are excluded direct costs. And there are rules, and you can read all about it, and I can follow up on how that works. But certain costs have to be excluded from the direct costs. And the other thing that we have to be aware of is that there are certain indirect costs that are not allowable to ever be charged to federal grants. And so those have to be bumped out of this equation too. So what we end up focusing on is we get the modified total direct cost, which means after we excluded the cost. And then in this case, we're going to use the 10% rate. And this is going to tell us that we're entitled to a total of $400,000 um, in the total modified total direct cost rate. Now why this matters is that if you are thinking about using the 10% de minimis rate, I hope that you have actually done this whole calculation rather than just glommed on to the 10% because it is quite possible and at the end of the slide deck you'll see an example that your allowable indirect costs may actually be considerably greater than 10%. And if you accept the 10% de minimis rate, you are not being reimbursed for those costs. And if you're an organization like that, that you do the test here to see what your actual modified total direct costs are, are and your actual allowable indirect costs are, and you come up with a rate that's higher than 10%, you may very well decide that you want to go back to that direct charging method and not use the 10%. So that's one of the choices you're going to look at. Yeah, Judy. Hey, I wanted to ask um, uh, Meta or Maureen, who are from um, DSHS, I don't think we have anyone here from OCVA, I, I'm pretty sure that one of the worksheets for the, the contractor grant applications that many of you have filled out has this 10% MTDC. Is that right? Maureen or, or Meta? Hi, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep, hi. Sorry, but we're we're not um generally available to answer <laughs> direct questions about compliance right. issues on this webinar, but I can affirm that yes, our budget worksheets for uh, the applications that you submit to DSHS and also to OCBA include a specific worksheet uh, that sort of walks you through that calculation for modified total direct costs. Great, thank you, and and um, sorry for putting you on the spot. Thank you. For yeah, no problem, time. and if we if we hear of yeah. things, we may, we may add something to the chat. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, we have a question um, that I just want to clarify, um, and that is total expenses in this organization, $4,450,000. Um, of those, $4 million are modified total direct cost base. There's another $40,000 in excluded direct cost, and then there's $10,000 in unallowable um, indirect cost. That's the fifty thousand. So we have the fifty thousand plus the four hundred thousand in the ten percent rate. That adds up to four hundred and fifty thousand, and then we have the four million. Um, so that's how this thing works. And then you can see how it works here in terms of the implications of using this ten percent rate. What it literally means is that I can charge a hundred thousand dollars on a million dollars of allowable, not excluded, 
direct cost. So it may be that I have excluded costs in that program. And here's an example of a program where we did have some excluded costs. We had $40,000 that it was part of the program. It was an allowable cost. The funder agreed to that. And we are going to be reimbursed for that $40,000. It's going to be in the total. But what impact it had was that we only got 10% of the modified total direct costs. And so it did have an impact that this rule required us to exclude some direct costs. And that's it's confusing when you see it and hear about it because you're thinking, but are you saying those are unallowable? No, they're excluded. These costs, the unallowable indirect costs, they are unallowable. And actually, this example was taken from a client of mine that always served a lot of alcohol at all their board meetings. They said attendance had improved since they had an open bar, but it was quite expensive. And um, of course, alcohol is always unallowable for federal funds. So they had to put that in their unallowable indirect costs. And we suggested that they stop that practice and they said that would never work. Um, so um, just interesting. Okay, I see that it is 1030. And um, this is actually a sort of good stopping point. So I am going to suggest that we go ahead and stop. It's actually 1033, according to my computer. So if you would be ready to rock and roll at 1045, that would be great. And we're going to whip through the rest of this compliance stuff and get into the strategies so that we have some time to really talk about that. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> I just saw some, some funny things have come in in the chat. Um, so, okay, everybody take a break and we'll be back. Thank you. Okay, well, hopefully people have come back. I can't see all the pictures, so I don't know, but I'm hoping you're back. And I did read a comment earlier in the chat about um, indirect cost rates. And you know, on the survey, what we saw was that, yes, there are some of the organizations that um, do have an indirect cost rate. I'm sorry to be bouncing this uh, bouncing ball around. I'm going to try and get rid of it uh, here, but not doing very well on that. So just a second. It's annoying me. Well, maybe I'm not going to do that. Okay. All righty. So um, to get back into the thing here. Um, they, so the question about having a federal indirect cost rate, the first thing to understand about a federal indirect cost rate is that to get one, you have to have a direct federal award from the federal government where you are a recipient, not the recipient through a pass-through. Um, you have to submit a proposal. You have to choose. There's a lot of choices to make about what method you want to use in your indirect cost rate calculation. So um, that's, you know, and I'm happy to talk with people about that outside of this workshop about how you would go about doing it and what's involved. And I'll be even happier to do that if I can get this red dot to disappear. There we go. Okay. Um, so uh, we're not going to go into the details here. There are slides at the end of the deck that really deal with the major ways to compute federal indirect cost rates. Big choice on whether you're going to include in the indirect category only your management or admin costs or whether you're going to use all of those shared or indirect costs. But we're not going to apply today. So I'm going to skip through some slides um, and just you know reiterate that it is important to know which method you're using. And what may be a more practical choice for most of the people on this call is, uh, since many don't have direct federal awards, can't get a federal indirect rate, the real choice is between using the direct charging cost allocation method and the 10% de minimum. Us. So that's the reference to all those additional slides on the indirect cost rate negotiation. And I'll just say these few words about an indirect cost rate. It has some great advantages in simplicity. And we're going to talk about those when we look at some examples of how can you lay out your choices 
if you are using cost allocation and direct charging, um, you're going to run into some complexity that could be reduced if you had a rate. Um, if you're using the 10% de minimis rate, it, I mean, it does have simplicity, but it also opens up the possibility that you're not going to be able to recover all of your administrative costs. So I want to say just a few more words about what was in the revisions to the Uniform Grants Guidance and what these most common mistakes in cost allocation are. Um, and the most common one being that we think that we can allocate a cost only among the funding sources that agree to pay for it. That is not a correct cost allocation plan. You have to allocate across all the programs or projects that got benefit from the cost. Um, so just something to check your plan on. Now, I asked you a bunch of questions on the survey about how you're tracking personnel costs. And the reason I was asking those questions is these requirements that the Uniform Grants Guidance does still say that if you are going to charge the cost of a position to a particular, particular funding award that has federal funds in it, you're going to have to have documentation that shows that that position was focused on delivering services related to that grant award. And many of us have structures in which we have one employee who we are paying through multiple grants. And so this issue of how do we build the documentation that will show that we did a reasonable attribution of the cost of that person to a particular grant, it's really an important question. And when we get into the strategies here, we're going to talk about some ways to make this easier on your staff. One of the problems that people encounter if they structure their payroll reporting system where they're asking employees to say not only, hey, I worked eight hours today, but to attribute their time. It's much easier for an employee to attribute their time to a programmatic function than it is to a specific grant. And the easiest example I have of what I'm talking about actually comes from agencies that run homeless service centers. And you know, a typical homeless service center, you've got a space, you've got all these people there ready to help homeless people. They talk to individual people who are homeless and they determine well, first of all, what does the person need, but also which of our multiple funding awards would allow us to assist this person. Now, the staff person who is doing that job, that intake job, knows that what they spent their time doing was interviewing and finding resources for homeless people. And so the program that they are aware that they are executing is homeless services. And they don't know at the time they start an interview which of the multiple funding sources are going to turn out to be the one that can pay to help this person. Is he a veteran? Um, is, there some, is it a domestic violence victim? Is there some other category that do they live in the right county to use this funding? source. So rather than trying to get people to do time recording that is attributing to funding sources, it turns out that it's much more straightforward to ask people to, uh, to do time recording based on the function that they were fulfilling. And we'll look at what a difference that makes when we're doing budget planning and accounting in a minute. Okay. I do want to mention that um, another big change in the 2020 revisions was the pass-through requirements, that, what pass-through entities have to do and can't do. And so we talked about this, um, but there's a new wrinkle here, and that is that they answered questions about something that was in the uniform guidance that said pass-through entities could negotiate indirect cost rates. So we were just talking about many of you do not have a direct federal award, so you can't negotiate with the federal government. 
if one of your pass-through entities were willing to negotiate an indirect cost rate with you, they are permitted to by the Uniform Grants Guidance, and the, the 2020 revision makes it clear that if one of your pass-through entities does do that, the others are required to honor it. So it's not an exercise in futility to ask a pass-through entity to negotiate with you. Now, they can still say no, and um, that, that it's their discretion to say that they can't, they don't have the, the capacity to negotiate with you. Um, but if they are willing to do it, their rate has to be accepted by others. And I see a question that I want to answer, but I just want to finish this pass-through entity section. Um, so if a pass-through entity is willing to negotiate, they do have to follow the same rules as the federal entities would follow. They can't make up their own rules for negotiating indirect cost rates. The one other thing I want to say about pass-through entities is that if you are an agency that actually has been awarding some funds to other organizations in your community, uh, this often happens in rural areas where you can't get everywhere and so you find a grassroots organization and you say, let us give you some of our funding so that you can carry out some of the services. You've really got to pay attention to whether the relationship you've entered into with that entity is a subrecipient entity that is going to make them responsible for following all the same federal rules that you have to follow. Um, and if you have that kind of relationship, you're passing money through to an entity, not as a contract, but as a true subrecipient agreement where they have responsibility for complying with the federal rules, then you are required to do a risk assessment of those sub-awardees. You actually have to get into understanding how they're going to follow those rules and whether they have the capacity to follow them. And and then having done that risk assessment, you have to decide what are you going to do about weaknesses that they have because often really small organizations don't have the accounting systems necessary to do this. So what's your strategy going to be? And whatever strategy you pick out, you've got a plan to monitor whether it's working, whether that sub-awardee of yours is following all the rules because you are responsible for their failures. And so you don't want to end up with audit findings based on a sub-awardee of yours not being able to comply with the federal rules. Um, now, I put in a couple slides to help if you have some of these agreements distinguish whether you are doing this on a sub-awardee, sub-recipient basis, or whether what you have is a subcontract. And it's an important distinction. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it right now, but I do just want to open up that if you are having trouble distinguishing and want to email me questions, I'm happy to answer them. But we have an important question that's popped up in the chat box that goes back to um, whether, how do, we, how do we handle staff costs, personnel costs? Can the same literal physical person be included and reported both as a direct cost and as an indirect cost? This is one of the clarifications that came in the 2020 revisions to the Uniform Grants Guidance. And the answer to to that question is yes, in certain very limited circumstances, that could be true. And that is a change from past practice. In the past, we had whole functions that we said, well, it's either going to be considered indirect or really administrative, or it's going to be considered direct service. And it's not, it can't be both. Well, now we've had a change on that. And what they are saying, and I'll give you a really specific example of how this could work, is that it is possible that you would have a function. Take, for example, the accounting function. Now, the accounting function is always going to be an administrative cost. There is no doubt about that. But the question of whether you have to consider it an indirect cost, 
It's probably a question that um, mostly applies to people who have a federally negotiated indirect cost rate. But the question of whether you have to consider it an indirect cost, pre the revisions, we would say, well, make up your mind, it's either going to be indirect or direct. Since the revisions, we now know that it is possible that when we're talking about the accounting function in an agency, most of the accounting function is going to be considered indirect it's administrative, it has to be allocated as a way of charging it. But there are occasions where someone performs an accounting function that is so program specific that it can be charged, the time they spend doing that can be charged entirely to that specific award even though most of the accounting function is considered indirect. Now again, I want to repeat, it's still an administrative cost in that example. So let's talk about a person who supervises four of your different domestic violence program initiatives. Now, usually I would say, well, that sets up a situation where we're going to have to allocate that person's cost. They're not probably going to go into an indirect cost rate because it's just a cost allocation problem. But what we do know is that we don't have to allocate all of their position through a cost allocation formula if they are able to maintain very detailed records of time spent on a specific program. Now, I would not do this for uh, things that are trivial, that are, well, yeah, maybe she spends a little bit more than the formula would uh, suggest on program one rather than programs two, three, and four. I wouldn't bother with it. But if you have someone whose time is just so clearly going into one cost center and the rest of their time is going to be allocated, that is now permissible if you have the records to substantiate it. And I'll, I'm happy to do more afterwards on that because that's kind of a complicated issue. Now, there were other revisions. I'm not going to go through the details here. I'm happy to send you more uh, material on them. But I think these indirect costs and pass-through revisions are the ones that are really going to be important to us when we talk about managing in a mixed funding model and dealing with some of these challenges. So I'm going to just mention some of the additional problems that have emerged after the revision to the Uniform Grants Guidance. And one of those, I mean, a problem it was also a great gift, right, that we got a lot of money out of CARES and the Coronavirus Relief Funds, Fund Relief, um, Relief Fund. Um, the big thing that happened, though, was that they told Treasury to manage it. And they issued those strange regulations that called for compliance with only some provisions of the Uniform Grants Guidance and explicitly prohibited record using, claiming indirect cost rates, even for organizations that had a negotiated indirect cost rate. And what they seem to be saying in those regs is if you want to charge some administrative functions to a CARES award, you're going to have to have what people who use the direct charging cost allocation method have always had, which is some basis for proving that that person spent time that benefited this CARES funded project. Now, I don't think it's become clear yet whether their intention was to literally say, you'd better have that accountant keeping a record of the time they spent doing the accounting for CARES as opposed to doing accounting for all the other funding sources you have. Um, that, that would be extraordinarily difficult because most accounting functions are performed across the board for the whole agency. Um, so I think, and I they believe most auditors think that they would be satisfied by a defensible cost allocation methodology similar to the one that you've been using if you are a direct charging organization. But it may cause you some trouble if you are just going with the 10% de minimis. So that is something to drill down on and to probably talk with your auditor about. 
I want to take a minute and talk about the PPP loans. Um, that was great. It really helped a lot of us. Uh, but I just want to be sure you are aware that it is the expenditures that you made with the PPP loan funds and which year, which of your fiscal years you did those expenditures that will determine the amount of the PPP loan that you have to add in to your total of federal dollars. And of course, it's that total of federal dollars that determines whether you need to have the single audit or the old A133 audit. If you've got $750,000 in expenditures of federal dollars, including the expenditures of your PPP loan funds, then you do need the single audit. Um, I think everybody knows by now that when you get the forgiveness of the PPP loan, that is income. Um, but the whole issue that arose about these PPP loans, and some people are still getting ready for audit on the period where they had the PPP loan, and I will just say the caution I have for you is uh, if you have claimed forgiveness for PPP loan funds that were spent to meet a cost, that you also reported to one of your federal sources, that is a problem. That is double dipping. Now, I think most of us are pretty clear that Treasury and the Small Business Administration, they got no resources at all to go out and do any auditing or follow up on any of this. So that's not where your trouble is going to come. Your trouble is going to come when your independent auditor observes that you have double dipped if you have. So if you haven't had your audit yet, now's the time to correct that and make sure that you did not charge the same expense to claim PPP loan forgiveness that you charged to an award that had federal funds in it. Um, the American Rescue Plan, that's the 2021 measure, that also was given to Treasury to administer. But the interesting thing, when you read their regs this time around, they've embrace the entire Uniform Grants guidance. And that means they're permitting both direct and indirect costs. So things got a little simpler. Um, and this is a lot of money that is still flowing to the states and to the tribes. And you see that time period. So there, there, there is still time where states and tribes are figuring out what they're going to do with this money. And um, I, I don't think it's particularly clear yet everything that's going to happen. Um, the funds have to be obligated, meaning by the state, uh, by uh, the end of 24 and spent by the end of 26. So this is something to be watching going forward. And Build Back Better, you know, that we read about all the time, uh, you know, it's passed the House, hasn't passed the Senate, we, nobody knows what's really going to happen. Uh, but certainly my expectation from everything I've been able to see is that if it does pass, it's going to involve some direct federal awards and also a lot of money passing through to the states and the tribes. And that uh, my expectation is this is not going to all be dumped on the Treasury. I think it's going to flow through the federal departments that currently manage most federal programs. And so I am hopeful that we're going to see the Uniform Grants guidance embraced, but nobody knows yet. Um, so we're hoping. Okay, now we're on to the challenges, and this is kind of the interesting part, I hope. Uh, I mean, I'm very interested in those federal regulations, and that was a real flyby. And so if you have questions about um, documenting your costs, documenting your administrative and your indirect costs, please feel free to follow up, and maybe we'll have a little time at the end, too. Okay, so uh, just remembering this, the challenges that we talked about at the beginning, uh, what I'm interested in talking about is what are some strategies that you could explore to address all those challenges while still maintaining compliance because you still have all this federal money. So what kind of challenges? How to support your core services, particularly if you're going to lose a chunk of your core funding. How to deal with the VOCA reductions, right? How to respond to this whole staffing challenge in this era when wages are going up. 
how, if you want to, to continue increasing the percentage of support from your non-governmental source. And that's a big question mark. That's a do you want to, and if you want to, how are you going to deal with it? And I would add the other question, how are you going to really learn how to manage an environment where a growing percentage of your dollars have the uncertainty that comes along with funding from individual donors? Very different environment than the grant funding environment where once a grant is awarded to you and there's a budget attached to it, um, in almost all circumstances, you know that you have those funds available to you as long as you have those expenses that you can document. So how are you going to manage in an environment that is shifting? Um, so I think the answer to that question in general is you're going to have to identify and test out options. We're, this is not a time where we're going to be able to approach budgeting by saying, well, let's look at last year's budget and, you know, put a 2% increase on everything and call it good. I don't think that's going to work right now. I think you're going to have to use a budget format that helps you understand the full cost of your core services not which costs have I got my VOCA grant to pay for, which costs do I have um, another grant source paying for, but really stepping back from the funding world and looking at the cost of delivering these various services. And so my first suggestion is that you consider working with a budget format that is what we call functional rather than funding source. Now this is this concept of cost centers and they're just buckets that you're collecting costs in, like costs, similar costs. And the two major methods that are used in nonprofit organizations is a method that says, well, my cost centers are my funding awards. I've got award one, two, three, on up to 60 different awards. I'm gonna do a budget for each of those awards. And then I'll have a column that I call unrestricted where I'll just you know, fill in the stuff that I can't charge to the grants. That's how a lot of us did it when we were mostly grant funded. But now that we're in a mixed income model, I would say that's not going to work. We're going to want to go to functional. I'm going to show you a sample in a minute. Um, and, you know, the first step after you do that functional layout is to figure out the extent to which a governmental contract or grant that you have that is supporting a particular service is it paying 100% of the full cost? Is it paying 50%? To really understand the gaps that you are having to fill in and to understand where you are choosing to put your unrestricted funds. So um, this all refers to a concept in the federal regulations of cost objective, and it gives you permission to say you can set up your cost objective, your cost center, any way you want to. You can set it up as a program or a function or an activity or an award. And we'll talk more about why that matters, that you have that ability to choose. So this is the classic functional budget format. And what you'll see I've done is down in the rows are all the different kinds of costs like personnel or professional services. The columns are functions like management, fundraising, and then I've got three core program functions that I'm using in this sample. And I'm going to arrange the cost based on, okay, what kind of cost is it? It's a salary, that's a personnel cost. Why are we paying this person? Well, we're paying them to perform management or fundraising or to work on prevention or to work on emergency services. And one person is often going to be fulfilling many functions. And so I may take one salary and spread it across all of these functions. But what I'm trying to understand is what's it going to cost me to get this work done? And by the time I've made a list of all my personnel and put the portion of their time that they're going to spend, say, on children's programs, I'm going to know the direct cost of the children's program. That is in contrast to a budget format that is organized by grant awards. And this is that, that style. It still has the line items, but it doesn't have the concentration 
on core programs and instead it's designed to really line up with grant budget and it leaves you with some uncertainty in that unrestricted column. Okay, most of us, even if we're like under $2 million, things are pretty complex because we have these multiple awards and these different kinds of funding. So I hope you have, if, if you're good with Excel, you've built your own linked spreadsheets, you've got this problem solved. A lot of us aren't that good with Excel, and so that's why it's really great that there is this free template that you can download that will give you a complete setup that is designed for organizations that have both multiple programs, multiple functions, and multiple funding sources. And it starts you out by making your personnel schedule, what are all the positions you're going to have, and having you distribute the portion of each of those positions that is attributed to each function, you know, like the functional budget I just showed. Maybe the executive director, a lot of their time is attributed to administration. Some of it is administered, is attributed to fundraising. And maybe some of it is associated with program one because the executive director actually functions as the manager of that program. So it sets you up on the template for listing all your positions. And after after you've categorized them by function, then you go back through and you show yourself what funding source you're planning to pay that position with. So you can have it both ways. It's a nice tool. Some people have built their own spreadsheets to do that, but this will help you out. Now, if you're larger, you might have invested in some software that is specifically budget software. Adaptive Insights is one that I'm familiar with, but there are many of them. Um, I actually gave you a link to one of my favorite shopping sites for sophisticated nonprofit software. And you can just look for any kind of, of the functions of software and just go shopping there. That's one of my favorite sites. So, okay, you got your tool. You've decided how to organize your budget in terms of, are you talking about cost centers that are by program or by funding source? Now the next step in getting ready to cope with these challenges is I think you've got to test multiple options. You know, you have a first idea and then you have a second idea and a third idea. And uh, it's if you've got a good software tool, it's pretty easy to test out, well, what if we did it differently? And obviously personnel is probably the most expensive item in your budget, so start there. And one of the options that I like to test is what happens if I change compensation levels? Because we're in this competitive environment and you know the question is, what, what are we gonna do? Are we just gonna do an across the board raise or do we need to really adjust compensation for certain positions or maybe we need to reconfigure our positions? Maybe we need to say, there's not going to be enough money to just keep all the positions we have doing what they're doing now. We're going to need to, one, take advantage of attrition if we're going to have some, or we may have to consciously reconfigure the staff and think about a different way of delivering our services. Now, this is what Judy was talking about when she said, even mentioning that, that you might be reconfiguring staff, is going to send off alarm bells for some people. And it's going to be very hard for them to hear that I am testing options. There is no decision made. The fact that it's an option is very frightening. So I think this is something that you may do initially in the finance office with the executive director to test out options. And then before you start a discussion with the board or with a larger staff, really have some, um, some certainty that you have an option that is worth looking further at rather than scaring people when you haven't proven to yourself that this could be beneficial. One of the things that I've always looked at when I hear about a funding source being cut, and I understand what I said earlier when Judy was with us, that if you get a significant cutback, it's going to it's be painful, but it's going to be relatively simple to say, well, we had a full-time position delivering this kind of service, and now that we're going to have less money, we are either going to have to um, 
reconfigure a position to add some other responsibilities so we can bring enough funding in to keep that person full time, or we might have to reduce the hours in that position. Well, okay, it's, it's relatively simple to plan that out in terms of service delivery, but the shrinkage that you're gonna have, your 10%, if you're using the 10%, it's going down, and you're not probably going to be able to shrink your core administrative functions. In fact, in this period where there's so much change and transition and you're getting new funding sources and you're dealing with changes, this is probably not the time to try to shrink that administrative function. So what can you do? Well, one of the options that I'm pretty interested in is outsourcing, and that's another scary word. But remember that if you can figure it out, it does mean that there is someone in your community or maybe somewhere else in the world who is going to be building their business and is hopefully going to be helping your organization significantly. Now, um, I, this is the thing I was just talking about, the, the impact of uh, funding cuts on allocated costs. It's not just the administrative costs, it's your other allocated costs. Maybe you've had an IT person, and now if the budget is going to drop, I mean, we still need IT services, but the base that we're able to allocate those costs on is going to shrink. So we've got to start thinking about that. Now, where have I seen success in outsourcing as, it's not just a cost-saving idea, it's a personnel support idea. It's making jobs that would otherwise be undoable because the responsibilities are too big for the hours available. It, it is making them doable. And it's also focusing our key people who have the greatest understanding of our work on doing the things that use their highest skill level and not having them spend time on a function that someone else could perform um, probably faster and cheaper. Um, so it's letting people work to their highest skill level and also supporting them to do the work that they are most needed to do. Well, so success I've seen, um, if you do newsletters or e-blasts or social media, great thing to be outsourced. You can find a lot of people who, who are just more adept at it than our staff who do other things. And actually pieces of your individual donor fundraising is very uh amenable to being contracted out. It's not your highest level relationship building with your larger donors. You're not going to contract that out. Um, but if it's maintenance of a donor database, it might be that. If it's crafting appeals, there are people who can churn those out so much faster than somebody who has a million other things to do. I used to think grant writing not a good idea. I've changed my mind on that. Sometimes it can be a very good idea, but you're going to have to really direct an outsourced grant writer, or you're going to end up with those funding for special projects and not for core services. Now accounting, we've got a bunch of accountants online, and probably that's a scary thing to say, but you know um, that Increasingly, as we've been in a remote environment, we we have started outsourcing more of our accounting functions. I mean, most all of us are using payroll service, but many of us started using something like Bill.com, an electronic remote accounts payable system. Hopefully, if you've got people traveling around and dealing with expenses, you've looked at Expensify or some of the other technology. But there are also accounting service providers who are taking on chunks of the accounting function so that you have a strategist at your office. They have the people who are doing a lot of the hands-on data entry. A lot of us have already contracted out for IT support quite successfully. Increasingly, there are so many HR, uh, admin, and benefits management firms that have very low prices. Now, they are not going to work with your staff on evaluations and help you on hiring in a meaningful way. That's not what I'm talking about, but there is a huge amount of record keeping in the HR function, and I am increasingly convinced that it can be done more cheaply and better by outsourced firms because they stay current on everything and they develop forms for 
multiple users. I just think if you have a beleaguered fiscal person who is having to do all that HR paperwork and back office stuff and also being the primary IT support, um, you might look at some of this outsourcing. Um, I think it's a little more complicated in the service de delivery arena, but I have seen some successful outsourcing on counseling or high-level counseling supervision. And definitely, I've seen some success on outsourcing facilities maintenance and property management. I know you have safety issues, so it's not, not a simple solution. Okay. Um, I think the key questions, if you want to think a little bit about outsourcing, is to think about the staff you have right now and whether they have both the expertise and the tools. I just had a conversation with a client who did not have the graphics tools to produce the um, the visuals that she wanted to use in a presentation and she could spend hours trying to learn how to do that and if she had an outsourced communications person with all that software they could do it in five minutes so you think about are you asking people to spend time where they don't need to spend time because you could buy it pretty cheaply and the big thing for executive directors and fiscal directors and also for program staff is the opportunity cost. Are you having people spend time doing routine tasks that don't need their expertise, but somebody has to do it? Rather than doing the things that are most important, like really supporting the other staff working in the shelter or working in your program, there's a, and for executive directors, I, if you've got an executive director who's doing hands-on work in accounting and budgeting, that's an opportunity cost. There's other things they need to be doing. And the final thing I would say is, you know, if you're seeing key positions in your program turn over repeatedly, now there's normal turnover, but you're seeing repeated turnover, I think it's worth talking with people about what is it that is causing people to leave. Now, it might be compensation, it might be personal factors, but a lot of times it's because we've made the job undoable and they're very dissatisfied with not being successful. Sometimes outsourcing can really help and really give people the uh, just the ability to do what they need to do once again to get rid of this. Okay, there's some difficult questions that are in what I've just been saying. Um, questions like, would you have a more sustained and satisfied workforce if you looked at having fewer positions but with better compensation and better support? It's a question. Are there ways that you can improve the working conditions and the way you support staff so that they will want to stay even if there's better compensation out there somewhere else for them? And this is where technology comes in. Um, now, you know, technology doesn't always reduce the number of staff you need. In fact, sometimes it just doesn't. But what it can do is improve the services and improve morale because people, again, are able to do their highest their highest skill level and what they feel most successful doing. Okay, there's a question that I want to talk about. It says, how does the organization that's being used for outsourced services by several agencies benefit, particularly when the cost to uh, is more to the agency that is providing outsourced services between nonprofits? So I, I, let me ask you a question. Are you talking about the situation where one domestic violence or sexual assault program agrees that it will perform some services on contract f with other organizations? Is that... Is that absolutely. what? Absolutely. I'm sorry. Absolutely. A absolutely. That's what you're talking about. Yep. Okay. Now, in my experience, that's a tough go. I got to tell you, because uh, you put the person who is staffing that function in the organization that is offering those services, you put them in a tremendously conflictual position because they have to decide between spending time meeting the needs of their organization and spending time meeting the needs of the clients. And that, which are these other organizations. So I think that you've got to at least acknowledge that. And the other thing that I find is that I, I, see, I see nonprofits entering into these agreements without 
realizing that whatever skill the person has, say they're a great accountant, whatever skill they have, that is not the same skill as managing client relationships. And, you know, managing client relationships seems to be thought to be like a no time consuming activity, but it's not. If you talk to someone who has worked in an outsourced accounting firm, you're going to hear that client relations is a major component of their work. And that's true for IT. It's true for HR. And so sometimes I think we have to be more reasonable in structuring these agreements to understand that it's not just that we're going to dump more work onto somebody who's good at it in the providing agency and then get a little income from the other agencies. And um, I, although it's a touchy subject, I would raise the question, would it be better for all of us to go to an independent outsourced agency um, that, that is set up to do client services and to impose limits on the demands of clients that isn't going to detract from our cooperative and collaborative relationships. Now that sounds really negative about shared services. I think shared services can work. I just think that it's it's one of those things like collaboration that it sounds so good until you're in the middle of it and it really has um, some complexity to it when you're the one at the center of this uh, little collaboration. Did I get at what you were talking about? Yeah, yeah, it's tough. Okay, more difficult questions. Um, do you want to actually set targets for trying to get more private funding? Um, if you do, uh, I guarantee you need to have agreement. You need to have a meaningful discussion with your staff and with your board so that we know that everybody wants this because there will be costs involved in moving in this direction. Same question about uh, fees for services you better be sure that everyone is in agreement that this is a strategy we want to put more emphasis on um, and, and understand that being successful in selling services is going to require some management skills that we don't have as a grants management organization or an individual donor fundraising organization. And, and I know from working with one of the sexual assault programs that actually had gotten to the point where they were able to do um, Medicaid and insurance billings, great source of income, but oh my gosh, what an investment in capacity building to be able to do that. Okay, the other thing that becomes a factor as you're testing out these ideas is how are you going to deal with the uncertainty that comes with things that aren't grant support? Now, individual donors, you know, fundraisers will tell you, well, the past can predict the future. Um, although what I find is that sometimes if the past doesn't look good, we ignore it and we say, well, that we're going to do everything different in the future. So I think it actually does have more uncertainty than a world where we sign a grant agreement and that's it. We have those funds available to us if we have those costs. A lot of uncertainty if you're going fee for service. Uh, before you do it, you've got to really understand your competitive position. Your control over utilization, if this depends on somebody else referring business to you and they are slow, you're not going to be successful. So you really need to understand this environment. You need to be sure that you're going to have power in setting the fee levels. And that is a different thing than proposing a grant budget. When you set fee levels, when you say, I'll do X for Y dollars, you'd better be sure that you have taken into account things like utilization, what's going to happen if you have low utilization, marketing, the need to generate some profit margin because in fee generation there will be good months and bad months, um, the impact of volume on the cost per unit. This is a business plan and if you're thinking about it, you want to get somebody who has pulled together a business plan to ha have you actually test out the assumptions that you're making about whether fee-for-service income is going to be helpful to you or whether, you have, whether you're going to have the capacity to really um, implement a fee-for-service strategy and manage it. Now, one of the things I'm really interested in is when I hear people are facing cutbacks and it's like ironic or some people would say crazy, um, 
can you really think about building new capacities when you're going through a period of funding cuts? And there's a lot to think about because organizational change of any kind is stressful, whether it's we're going to have to reduce something or even rapid growth. You've been through a lot of rapid growth. You know how stressful that is. So uh, when you're thinking about building a new capacity, uh, you've got to understand where you're starting. And my first question would be is how stressed is the organization already? Are we like on the edge? Are we losing people? Is our turnover increasing? What's our financial health? Because if we have no reserves, we probably can't take many risks. And trying to build a new capacity like increasing individual donors, that is taking a risk. Um, and, you know, really the truth about most capacity building strategies, like we're going to do better with individual donors or we're going to go fee for service or we're going to do better with foundations, they take multiple years to really realize benefit. And um, so do you have that time? Do you have the financial reserves to carry it for a couple of years? Okay, those are some questions you're gonna be asking. You're gonna be trying to build models of the options you're considering. But the thing is, you're gonna have to get the rest of the organization to join in in really considering what are the best strategies. And so you've got to build your board engagement in these major financial choices. And you know, one of the things that just um, kind of breaks my heart more than frustrates me is what I do a lot of board training and board facilitation of planning. And often I sit in on the board's business meeting before we do it. And I will see boards just in an excruciating discussion of an annual budget where people are questioning this cost and that cost and they're often not questioning the personnel costs which are the largest cost and it's it's just um it's it's just a very frustrating thing when i realize but wait this board has never talked about the underlying questions, the underlying assumptions, the underlying choices. Because producing numbers on a page, we've got good finance people who can do that. They can translate ideas into um, the calculations. That's not what we need the board for to test our calculations. We need the board and our other staff to help us decide what to do about these challenges. So what about compensation? What is our compensation philosophy? Um, do we have a compensation philosophy? Um, and I know sometimes people think, well, we can't, we don't have time to talk about that. We got to get this budget done. But really, that's probably what's going to impact your ability to recruit and retain staff. So it's time to have a compensation philosophy. Um, what about um, our goals for income composition shifts? Do we want to try more from individual donors or more from any other stream? What about outsourcing? You know, some people really have objections to outsourcing. Other people have pretty unrealistic ideas about it, but that's a, that's a major decision if it's going to be significant outsourcing. What about the fact that we might have to reduce some of the services we're providing or even conceivably conceivably um, uh, eliminate some. So that, again, we need engagement on that, on the capacity building topic, and on the financial health topics. Michelle, I see you flashed on. Is it because there's a question there that I should answer? There is, yeah. And I, you know, I had this question not that long ago as well. And, and my, I think I know the answer to this, but I want to see what, what your answer is, is if you, for, for outsourcing, oh. if you hire a consultant, not a contractor or recipient that charges a fee over 81.25 an hour, which is the federal limit, with your, can you pay that 81.25 out of your DOJ funds and then the remainder of the fee with different fund source or do they frown on that? Yeah, I think they frown on that. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think that's the, that's the whole point here. You know, um, what, what consultants actually do is they get you to agree to a larger number of hours to accommodate that restriction. Because it is yeah. it's a pretty unrealistic uh, restriction. But I. That was I, our strategy, yeah. Thank you. I, I mean, I. Um, 
I would check with my DOJ funder, but I would not expect them to agree. Oh yeah, just just add some more with your unrestricted funds. I don't think so. Um, it's it's a real problem. In other words, not an easily solved one. Well, so I think if you are kind of going along with me in the idea that these are some big choices that we need to get the board and probably portions or maybe all of our staff um, to join in and help evaluate the the most promising options. I'm not saying that we want all these people uh, uh, somehow evaluating 20 different ideas. That's not going to work. Uh, I think we're going to have to have a leadership team, definitely finance director, executive director, and other leadership team members that sort through our ideas and do some modeling, produce multi-year projections for each of the ideas so we can get the, the most promising ideas ready to discuss with the broader group. I think it's really important that everyone, definitely the board, but I would say even our staff, need to understand what our current financial health is. And these are some of the things, and you know, I'm happy to amplify if people have questions on that. Um, but the things that I, basically, this is a lot of balance sheet data, and I know a lot of us are very focused on revenue and expense, but really, your capacity to take risk comes from the balance sheet. It comes from your cash reserves and from your unrestricted net assets. And sometimes, you know, we have board members that just like glaze over when we're looking at a balance sheet. And we're going to have to take time to get them to understand our position. Is it strong or weak? The other thing is people talk about turnover, but you know, it's, it's just talk if you don't actually produce some data. Let's take, a, you have records, let's take a look over time and find out whether our turnover is increasing. Is the average tenure dropping? Which positions is turnover in? And sometimes, you know, we fixate on a type of position where we've had turnover because that was the one that was so hard to deal with. But actually that was an exceptional moment that wasn't a pattern so can we really look at the patterns before we jump in with a solution um, I it's not like I want to bore your board members with a discussion of admin and indirect costs but I think they do have to have a basic understanding of the core concept that these are real costs that we have to have and we have to find a way to get them covered and some of our funders are unwilling to pay their fair share so people have to have that much understanding to be able to talk about the choices and we need to be able to show them which of our sources, our governmental sources, are paying the full cost and which are not and are leaving us with gaps and how are we meeting those gaps. So that's kind of preparing people to think about these things. And I think, you know, Judy just told you that she doesn't really, nobody knows exactly what's going to happen with VOCA, but some of your other streams are more predictable. And I think you can do a simple table for people to understand what is it we know and what is it that we think we know. And I've seen some real effective stuff with color coding to show the ones that are pretty certain and these that are in you know red are uncertain so that everybody has the same context for thinking about options and if we are going to be talking about fees for service I really think you've got to give people high level data not the details not the endless financial statements high level data on what did you gross what were the expenses what was the net going back three years, and what are you anticipating going forward three years? Because this building of a fee base is never a one-year project. And it's the same thing on individual donors. We've got to look back and we've got to project forward. And, you know, these are the measures that most fundraisers say you should pay the most attention to. You probably have other ones that you um, like to pay attention to. And, um, but it is important that people don't go with their assumption or their feeling because our feelings often are distorted by our anxieties. Okay, so... You're going to pull all this information together. Um, how are you going to present it to people that you want to participate in the decision? 
Um, well, I'm a fan of bullet part and point narratives, not long essays. Nobody's going to read that. Um, I think uh, you can just lay it out in a very short order. What am I assuming in these different options about these key decisions? And, you know, if you can't summarize what the core change that you're considering in an option is in a bullet point that takes no more than three lines, I don't think you've thought through the option clearly. It's got to be summarizable. Now, this is a tool that I, one of my colleagues, Jessica Clark, uh, uses, and I just think it's kind of helpful in a way, so you might want to consider it. Uh, this is trying to translate what was in those bullet points into more of a list format where we're saying, well, here's an option that we're considering, and here are the things that would actually either reduce our expenses or increase our income. These are the things that would have a positive impact on our net. And down here are some things that we're considering that would have a negative impact on our net. And um, let's, let's get concrete about what we're talking about. And the reason I like this idea is that sometimes people want to get all worked up about an, a change like this that's a $5,000 change, and they don't want to spend time talking about the $45,000 change. So sometimes putting the number with the change is really helpful. Um, now we're going to get into the crux of the matter. It, we got to have a budget format that people can understand. And for all the accounts of the world, I want to say that everything I'm going to show you is highly summarized. It represents not hours, days, weeks of work by the finance person to do the detailed underlying data. But the fact of the matter is that for most of your, um, board members and other staff members, you've shown those underlying worksheets and you're, you're going to lose them. So we got to get a format that they can understand. And so um, I'm going to illustrate a simple form format that I like um, that really does use that idea of, um, I'm going to risk the pointer again, um, you know, you would have details on the revenue. You would always have the list of the major sources, but I summarized it to make this shorter for the screen. And then you're going to show the total direct expense for each of the functions that are listed here. And we've got management, fundraising, shared cost, and then the programs. I'm going to show the allocation of shared expenses, and then I'm going to get them the total expenses before I apply management costs. That's what I do down here, and I get to total expenses. Why do I think these non-accountants would be interested in seeing how we share out the common expenses and how we share out the management? Because if I'm about to talk about a program that's income is going to shrink, a grant is going to shrink, it's going to change not just the cost in that program, it's going to change the share of management costs that goes to the other programs programs and the share of shared costs. And you can say that, but if people can't see it, they really don't understand what you're talking about. So, you know, we go to a net revenue or shortfall. Okay, what? here's what we think the new income is going to be. Here's what we think the expenses are going to be. What's the net going to be? And you know, this is before I, I use in this revenue part, I'm using only the committed revenue, only the grants where we've got definite money coming for specific programs or for specific purposes. Down here, I'm going to take that unrestricted support that we are planning to raise, and I'm going to show how much I have to subsidize each program. In other words, in program three, what's the difference between the grant funding I have for that, both foundation funding and government funding, any fees that it might generate? What's the difference between the total income that's going to be produced there and the total expenses? Because that's what I'm going to spend our unrestricted money, closing that gap. And I have found that when you talk to board members and staff about how you are using unrestricted money to close the gap,
They sometimes have a new understanding of why you need unrestricted money, but more than that, about have our priorities kind of gotten out of whack here because of history. And the history that I mean is we often start offering a program when it is fully funded by a source, and then over time that source does not cover it all, and we're having to fill in the gap. I think a discussion of budget choices really helps to get people focused on do these reflect what we really see as the most essential nature of our work? Are we spending our unrestricted money to shore up the most essential services? Now, I had a question that came out in the survey around dealing with carryover funds. Now, you know, there are budget formats that deal with that by just mirroring the gap accounting that you do, that you see it on your audit that deals with the difference between restricted funds and unrestricted funds. And the fact that often with restricted funds, they are going to carry over into a subsequent year. So that's one way I'm going to show you an example that uses that method. But, you know, there's another method that's simpler for organizations that might find it hard to use that gap format. So let's, let's look together for a moment at the gap format budget format. You know, this starts out just like what we were looking at before. It's got the multiple programs, the management, the fundraising, and this time I put the expenses on top, um, but here are all those different revenue categories. And so I really have provided the standard revenue and expense information, but what I haven't included in this top part is the impact of any restricted funds. So this is all unrestricted. And I'm putting my government money in there because although, you know, obviously it's, it, there's endless restrictions on government money, it's not gap restricted. Most government awards are not treated as restricted by GAAP. So what I'm talking about when I'm down here in the restrictions is I'm talking about things like foundation grants that have carryover funds. Now I suppose you could use it for carrying over government funds too. And that, would, that would be a possible adaptation. But what I want you to get out of this budget is that one of the elements that we are going to consider a type of income to support our expenses is our ability to release funds that we got in a prior year from restrictions and use them in the year that I'm showing a budget projection for. And that's going to let me see what the net unrestricted is going to be. If I'm going to do that, then I'm going to have to balance it out by having a section about the restricted activity. And, you know, those of you who look at gap accounting stuff will recognize that this is the stacked format for presenting unrestricted and restricted funds. So I've actually had success with this format with boards in getting people to understand that we have a bunch of income that's going to come in this year and be available to use for this year's expenses. We have a projection of what the expenses are going to be, but the rest of the story is going to be that we are going to be able to use some restricted funds that we got in a prior year to cover the expenses of this year. And, and I actually find this helps people to see it laid out better than explaining it to them because they can't hold on to it. And the other thing it lets me show is that, we, hey, during the year, uh, we're also going to be raising some new restricted money because we hope to have some funds available to carry over at the end of this year. Okay, that's, uh, that's the more complicated gap format. Another way to tackle this issue uh, without getting into that gap accounting is to say, well, let's show the income for this year uh, that is attributed to these various programs and that we'll get by charging a 10% rate or whatever we're able to charge for administration. Let's look at the expenses. Let's see if that gives us a net income or a net loss. If it shows a net loss and the real plan is we're going to use funds that are carried over from year to year, 
then that is a planned use of net assets. And I go ahead and list it here below. And I also, for my own information, want to say, well, what's going to be left? Hey, if we're using up $100,000 of our reserves, how much is going to be left? Now, in some cases, it's going to be great. You've got plenty of reserves, and that's going to reassure people that, yeah, this is just the normal course of business, that we use funds that we obtained in a prior year to cover the costs of this next year. Um, so I, I think this can work pretty well for some discussions. Okay, so I've already tipped my hand, I would say not too many options. Um, and when you're gonna present an option for coping with the challenges, so these are options for the coming year, um, I really do think you've gotta get the, the narrative for this option on one page with bullet points and the money, the financial implications for this option on one page. Uh, I know that sounds harsh, but think about those charts I just put up. You, I, I tend, I will say, unlike one of those charts, I tend to give people the details on the revenue line items and compress the expense items into personnel and non-personnel expenses when I'm trying to get people to see the big picture. Yeah, the Finance Committee can get into all the detail of all of that, but for people to grasp what the situation is and what the proposal is, I think we have to, um, we have to get it so they can see it in one viewing, on one page. And when you start having people flip through pages, most people are going to get lost. You've got to have a lot of white space. One of the, I have this problem in my own work. One of the worst problems is caption headings. You know, as we work through multiple versions of our spreadsheets, we call the same thing by different names. Like sometimes I called it management and sometimes I called it admin. You don't want to do that. You want consistency in your column headings. And that's something you can ask a, a colleague to look at them because you won't see it. You won't see that you've been inconsistent. Um, highly summarized expenses. So. What I'm suggesting is that you really do have an opportunity here to engage others in making major choices. But before I do that sort of final opportunity, I see a question that I want to look at. Does your example work for carryover funds that are already received? Yes. And that is a great question because one of the great sources of confusion, I think, is the difference between cash flow projection and financial projection. A cash flow projection is a tool. It isn't any of these things that I've shared. It's a tool where you start with what's the opening cash going to be? What new cash are we going to bring in? What cash are we going to have to pay out? And how much cash are we going to have left at the end of the month? And we spread that out for the 12 months and we keep replenishing it. So we've always got a 12 month projection. That is a cash flow projection. And it's, it's a very important tool for managing an organization to be sure you'll have cash when you need it. But it is different from these financial projections that are designed to give you a tool tool that you can compare to your financial statements, to your actual accounting records. Because remember, once we cook up a strategy and we adopt a financial plan, it's not going to be worth anything if we can't compare it to what actually happens that comes out of the accounting records. And I think all of us are doing accrual accounting, so what comes out of the accounting records is not going to be limited to what cash came in when or what expense do we pay this month, but we didn't get around to paying that bill till next month. It's going to be accrual-based accounting. So we're doing accrual thinking when we do these financial projections. And that means that when I'm talking about carryover funds, I'm talking about um, either a balance in the restricted net assets. In the case of a foundation grant, I, I was awarded a three-year grant uh, and it's not conditional. It was the kind that I reported. I recorded the whole amount in the year that I got it. 
and we've spent about a third of it and I've got two thirds left. It's showing up as restricted net assets. Same thing on a government contract. Most government contracts, the way we're going to be doing accounting is the that now we're pretty clear that if it's a reimbursement contract, we don't record income until we have the expenses that can be claimed on the grant. And so that might mean that my award was for $100,000, but this past year I only had $80,000 in expenses that qualified. And so uh, the funder has agreed that I can bring that $20,000 forward and add it into the new fund that I'm going to be awarded. If that's your case, when we are putting the income line for that funding source, we're going to include both the $20,000 and the $100,000, right? Both that carried over because it's not going to show up on our counting records as being carried over. And that's a kind of technical accounting conversation. I'm happy to have it with people, but the way that gap accounting is treating government funding tends to mean that we're not going to have shown that as a carryover amount. Whereas in foundations, we would, we would have restricted net assets. Well, I do want to wrap up with one more slide. Um, and that is, you know, what do I hope you're going to do after this discussion? I, I hope that you have started thinking about what some of the big choices you might need to make to address your challenges. And I hope you take a look at those slides about preparing the board to make choices and make sure that they do understand your current position and a little bit about your history. Then you're going to work in your leadership team to figure out what are the most promising strategies and you're going to do financial models for just the best options. I hope you're going to discuss those with the staff and with the finance committee and then develop a timeline and a work plan to actually implement. And we are out of time, I think, but uh, if there are questions people want me to try, I'm happy to do it. But I also, you, you have my website there and you can contact me through my website and ask questions by email and I'm happy to deal with that. So it's back to you, Michelle. Great. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end the recording.